yourself, maybe just tell me your name and when, where you teach and what you're teaching. So, uh, Pete Brodian, I'm a Cascade engineer, graduate of Science and State. Oh, right, starting class of 84. Uh, I teach mathematics here at Independence High School. Okay. I've been there 34 years. Um, and I uh, still have all the, the love that I had. You're still here, you're here. Yeah. 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 Great, it's a pleasure meeting yeah. you. Nice to meet you. Hi, good evening. My name is Michelle Baraki, and I'm working on opening our next high school at East San Jose. Uh, prior to that, I was at Kip San Jose Collegiate the last four years, teaching and leading um, in science and STEM. You're uh, going to be presenting. Yeah, so we're all so going to get I, to meet I, you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Katie Quay. I teach honors chemistry at Mission South High School. I'm Gail Kahn. I teach biology at Lincoln High School. Got my credentials. All right. I'm Mark Hahn, class of 86. Oh, wow. <laughs> I teach at Leland High School, teach AP Bio, and Anatomy and Phys. I'm Barbara Shrimp. I teach at Branham High School, and I teach Engineering and Math. Um, I'm Sam Palm, um, teaching Chemistry at Homestead High School. Great. So, um, anyhow, so I'm a professor at San Jose State, and you know that can tell me pretty well. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit of my uh, kind of STEM journey, um, and uh, so that's me, uh, honestly. Um, but on campus, uh, they call me Dr. Burrito, and I'm going to share with you a little bit of, of how that happened. And you're going to see that the science, uh, my kind of science uh, background, is kind of blended into your world, which is education. And I'm just going to share some of that, that journey. Um, and for me, that journey started at, at Cal State Northridge. Um, and even started in a public speaking class. And I'm going to show you a slide from my public speaking class. Um, the reason for this. Um, and some of you who teach uh, um, chemistry kind of recognize. So this is a, a series of reactions where um, chlorine can react with, with ozone, producing chlorine monoxide, um, which reforms with oxygen, producing another chlorine atom, which reforms with ozone. This thing, this is called the catalytic cycle, which most of you probably know. And this can happen 100,000 times. So one chlorine atom can, can convert 100,000 ozone molecules into something else. And um, we knew that this was, you know, this was happening, but we didn't expect that um, the extra chemicals that we're putting into the atmosphere would cause something called the Antarctic ozone hole. And this is a region of, of very low ozone. Um, and it was a complete, complete surprise when we discovered it. And there were some NASA scientists and some scientists at the British Antarctic Survey that first um, realized that ozone levels were declining um, way faster than we had anticipated. Um, and I became interested in this um, in my public speaking class, and it ultimately led me to study physics and then atmospheric science. Um, here's a, a record of how ozone levels changed from the year 1960 to 2000. Um, and so ozone levels declined. We were obviously all very concerned because without the ozone layer, we wouldn't be living here on this planet. And I have to say as an atmospheric scientist that my five mile bike ride over here today was not the most enjoyable bike ride we've ever had. The particulate level is super high. Um, there's no good public transit options here. And I'm a, I'm a, you know, I do own a car, but I didn't bring it. Um, and so, you know, we, we do live on this planet and we're trying to like all figure out how to do that. Um, but this um, would be worse is if we let ozone levels decline too much, then we just couldn't go outside. Um, but the good news is, is this is the, the future that we expect to happen. So the scientists uh, work with policymakers, and we said, oh, let's do something about this. Um, the science is pretty clear. Policy you know, alternatives were pretty straightforward. There were companies could make alternative chemicals that were more ozone friendly. And, uh, and this is what we expect. But um, uh, one of my colleagues at NASA Goddard, Paul Newman, who's not the Paul Newman you know, but another Paul Newman, he's a nice guy. Um, he ran a series of climate model simulations where he said, what if we didn't pay attention to the science? What if we said, oh, it's a hoax, it's all these scientists that wanted to like, gather all this money, or you know, we should still continue to study this. What if we had uh, ignored this? And so he ran some simulations, and here's what would happen to the ozone layer if we had not, in 1985 and 88, taken action to phase out ozone free chemicals. He calls it the future world that we avoided. And in that future world, um, we see that ozone levels um, essentially plummet. 
Um, what would that look like? Um, well, we know that there'd be extra um, solar radiation because the ozone layer is what blocks us, uh, blocks the earth from solar radiation. And by 2050, this model suggests that we would be sunburned in less than five minutes, the average skin tone person. Now that's changing our planet very dramatically. Um, what does that look like? I mean, that might look like this, um, which is sunburn, or it might look like this. I don't even see that. That's gross. Um, or we might have to live kind of like this. Now, none of that happened. Um, that's the future world we avoided. But um, for me, that was an amazing lesson because um, I was able to work at NASA Goddard, um, in one of the biggest groups studying ozone um, in the world. There were 100 scientists there who were responsible for some of the initial studies, for some initial observations. And uh, what uh, they discovered or rediscovered was, OK, yeah, he was responsible. Um, bad things are going to happen if we don't do something. And fortunately, uh, we have done something. So uh, that's how I got interested in atmospheric science and the environment. Uh, and it's kind of a good story. But now we talk about climate change, which is what I focus on, which really over the last 15 years has been my research area. And um, if we look at the record of uh, global average temperatures, um, and we have the last data point 2016 right here, we can see especially since about 1970 that the Earth's global average temperature has been rising um, pretty steadily. So if you just take this number of zero, and we're you know, we've got almost a degree Celsius, two degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is a big change. And I was talking to a reporter this morning who was asking me about the connection between wildfires that we're seeing right now and climate change. And uh, yeah, this is exactly, this is a, a climate change type event. Um, we have prolonged drought. We get a whole bunch of rain uh, in the wintertime. It promotes a whole bunch of, of new growth. And it dries out in a normally dry summer. And, it's a good, and we have now these wind events, good recipe for fire. Um, and we have seen, we've documented the increases in fires. Um, we've seen uh, losses in, in ice over the Arctic, uh, very well documented. Um, and we are seeing uh, costly weather extremes. So this is just 2016. Uh, we had 15 weather and climate events that cost over a billion dollars in damage. And um, this coming year, 2017, I, you know, the number's going to definitely probably be over billion dollars in damage um, with the three hurricanes, uh, wildfires. And, um, so many folks in the country think, okay, we've got to do something about this because it's just costing us. Now, the problem with climate change is long term. It takes a while. Even if you do something today, how when is, you can see the benefit of that. Um, from a science standpoint, uh, and I think your students, um, you know, I'm sure have heard about climate change. But there is this debate about it, the so-called debate. Um, in the scientific community, there's really not a debate. Uh, there is plenty of debating, but it's about kind of subtle issues related to our climate system. Um, but it's an open question I mean, that I think is valid, is, is how do we know what's causing the recent changes in climate? Um, we know that the sun can change climate. We know that volcanic eruptions can change climate. But um, we do a whole bunch of kind of very sophisticated uh, math and science to try to understand what role does the sun play? What role does volcanic eruptions? What role does the Earth's orbital variations around the sun? Um, but what we found is that the number one um, cause to the increase in global average temperature today is the rise in carbon dioxide. And this is coming from the burning of fossil fuels. And I could show you the evidence uh, or the lines of evidence, the four or five kind of lines of evidence that the scientific community has used to try to make sure we didn't mess up, we didn't make a mistake, that we missed something. Um, in fact, you could be very famous if you could prove that this is not what's contributing to our warming climate. Um, and we'd be very interested in that, but we have not been able to do that. Um, we know that, um, that electricity generation, transportation, food production, all of those things require energy. And those energies that, that come from fossil fuels, that that produces carbon emissions, um, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and that that changes the climate. So um, that's a kind of you know, uh, a quick rundown of, um, of our kind of climate change situation. If we look at what's going to happen in the future, and this I think your students would also be interested in, um, this is the temperature change um, from, 18, from 1950 through today. This is observed. Um, and then these are projections going forward with these different like, possible scenarios. And we don't know how many people are going to be around in 2050. We don't know 
what kind of cars they're going to be driving, what kind of energy is going to be powering their homes and their businesses. So they have these different scenarios here. But even the kind of lower emission scenarios, all of them showing the temperature rise, which is today about one degree, going to two degrees Celsius uh, by the uh, middle of the century, and potentially much higher. The last ice age, just to give you a frame of reference, the last ice age was about four or five degrees cooler than today. The last ice age had, you know, 5,000 feet over Michigan. 5,000 5, feet of ice over Michigan. So the world would look quite different at four or five degrees cooler. But we could also imagine if we kind of put that around at four or five degrees warmer, the world's going to look a lot different, especially when you have 10 billion people on the planet. So um, the United Nations has said that two degrees should be our target. Let's try to keep the temperature rise below two degrees C. We can probably kind of deal with that. I mean, we're still going to have problems. Um, we be affected, but if we let it go to three or four or five, then we really have, you know, really significant issues on our, on our planet. Now, what some folks would, be li would like to see is a scenario like this, where we uh, are able to stabilize climate and actually lower it. And uh, you'll be kind of proud to know that uh, California is actually um, fixed along these lines. So some of the projections that Governor Brown um, for energy use uh, has looked at in terms of uh, electricity and also automobiles uh, are trying to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050, which is, uh, which is the kind of number that we need to go to, to, to do this. Now, the rest of the world has to contribute as well. So what can we do about this? Um, so I, I spent a lot of time in my research focusing on this kind of stuff, um, trying to understand um, some of the wiggles and the projections of the future. But when I teach classes like that, about when I teach a whole semester of classes in a class like that, um, my students get kind of like bummed out, depressed. Kind of like, you know, about famine in Africa. It's kind of a story we just don't really like to hear a lot about because there's not much you can do. So, uh, but in this case, and just like family and Africa, there, there are things we can do. Um, there are things we can do. And when I started thinking about it at a personal level, um, I found some interesting insights. So I, I told you I run my bike here, so I like bikes, and, and I also like burritos. So um, I started looking at my own impact on the planet, my own kind of like carbon impact. And I started looking at the food choices that I made. Um, and I created something here called the, um, the Burrito Enjoyment Index and that's how much people enjoy burritos. And I found that the average American compared to myself was quite different in terms of uh, my enjoyment of burritos. But, um, but it, caused, it, it actually encouraged me to do something called a burrito showdown, where I compared the carbon footprint of a chicken burrito versus a beef burrito. And I was very surprised to see that my simple choice, if I go to Chipotle and get a choice of a burrito, which they both cost about the same, um, the carbon associated energy to make these different types of burritos is very, very different. Um, and this kind of led me along to, to start looking at food um, as one of the things that people can do about climate change. Now, um, the uh, type of car we drive also has an impact. And our research found that the, um, that the type of food you eat and the type of car you drive have a similar contribution to our total carbon footprint. So if you choose an a energy efficient vehicle like Prius, that's kind of like eating kind of low on the, uh, on the food chain. And if you use a car that requires more energy, that's more like the kind of car. Now, um, I drive plenty, but I also ride my bike. So then what about the, um, the bicycle? So what's the, um, what's the carbon footprint of riding a bicycle? Like my bike ride over here today, five miles. Including the manufacturer of the bike? No, that's just, that's just, <laughs> that's not good. How much gas the burrito produced? Well, now you're getting, now you're getting close, right? Yeah, you got to burn fuel. Right, I had to get here, right? And it just doesn't come for free. So it's basically how I'm fueled myself. And of course, I eat burritos, right? So, um, Do they eat burritos or chicken? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> thank you. That's a perfect lead-in. So um, it turns out that if it's a beef burrito, it's equivalent to 75 miles per gallon driving a bicycle. And if it's a chicken or a veggie burrito, it's equivalent to about 500 miles per gallon. So it actually does matter what fuels me when I'm on my bicycle. Anyhow, this is just some kind of interesting but kind of silly stuff that um, I ended up getting involved in 
um, when I co-authored a book called Cuisine, Taking the Bite Out of Global Warming. And in terms of my career, um, I was like, I'm a scientist, write peer-reviewed literature, go to conferences, don't talk to folks like you, talk to other scientists about you know, science stuff. But um, after I got involved with this, I gave a whole bunch of talks about this kind of stuff um, to the general public, bookstores, um, universities. And I, I, many people might have, perhaps, found it interesting, or you know, especially about the connections with food. But the one group of folks um, who weren't there were kids. And um, so at San Jose State, I went to some <coughs> of my colleagues there and said, I'd like to tell these same kind of stories about food and climate change and things we can do, not so much just the depressing stuff, but the more empowering stuff um, for younger audiences. And uh, they helped me invent uh, this character called Green Ninja. And uh, so Green Ninja is a climate action superhero um, who takes action on climate change and, and hopefully inspires kids to, to do something about our changing climate. So uh, we started this probably like six years ago um, by making videos. So see, these are some of the videos. We have uh, animated live action films. We made some games too. Um, these are educational games, but kind of fun games. And then we also have something called the Green Ninja Film Festival, which actually I would encourage anyone in here uh, to participate in. Um, it's a, uh, and if you, if you want, um, you can contact me. Um, but it's a um, storytelling and filmmaking um, in a science class. So students learn something about climate science and what they can do about it, and then tell their own um, story about solutions to climate change using uh, iPads and, and story, really using story, telling authentic stories that are relevant for them in their own communities. We're actually studying this with an NSF grant right now um, that um, most students find it uh, very interesting and valuable experience. So we've been doing that for a few years. Um, I decided to focus on children uh, in part because I think they can be impactful. And some studies have shown, like this one, last night in Holland, report that children average a purchase influencing attempt every two minutes in shopping with their parents. You can kind of imagine a kid like tugging on their, their dad's pen saying, I want to buy that. Um, and we know that, that uh, if behavior and, and attitudes for young people translates into potentially activism or college students um, who end up in industry. In fact, I'm doing a study right now where we're looking at, at that translation over time and how um, environmental stewardship can, can move through, um, through ages. So our team at San Jose State or, um, includes um, scientists, artists, educators, and engineers, um, both faculty and students. And we created something called the Green Ninja Show, um, which are these videos. And here am I. I got roped into these videos. Um, here I am interrogating a burrito. This is with my burrito meter. And uh, there's two different burritos, and I'm testing them out. Of course, this is, uh, well, yeah, it's serious. And then here's another one. I bet you've never seen this photo. Um, here I am on a burrito farm. Probably never, none of you have visited such a place. but. Um, this is where these Chipotle burritos grow from. And I don't know if you can see, but they look at the roots on that burrito. I just pulled it out of the ground. <laughs> so yeah, it's silly. It's not too serious. Um, of course, um, this is a serious issue, climate change. So we use humor to try to, um, to make this more of an empowering message and less than a depressing message. Because if it's depressing, you probably won't do anything about it. So and then in the last couple of years, we've started to produce formal curriculum call this Story Science Solutions. And we use, um, our goal is to uh, promote student engagement in science um, through story and environmental solutions. So we have to use storytelling, um, both in written form, film, um, and then students, the, the work they're doing is primarily uh, earth science, life science, physical science, but it's around environmental solutions. So the students are producing environmental solutions that are relevant, hopefully, to them and their communities. Um, so we have a um, middle school curriculum, I know you're all high school uh, teachers, but we finished uh, year six and year seven, um, and this is aligned, we built this um, using NGSS, of course, which is, I don't know if you're excited about it or not, but it's coming, you know, so. Um, and uh, our curriculum, um, the focus is, of course, like I mentioned, NGSS, we do videos and games, um, I don't know if these of you guys in plan science is never super easy, it's a challenge, but um, you have six units to go with every year, and each unit has a kind of uh, 
culminating experience, which is around some kind of real world uh, environmental problem. Um, and since we're all educators, the, the themes of this story and narrative, our goal, and hopefully we'll get there, um, is to use story and film and community projects and data investigations um, to hopefully have these student outcomes. Is that our, our primary goal is about motivation, getting students interested in science um, and, and expand on their personal agency, like, wow, they can actually make a difference. Um, we'd like them to, to know about the type of careers these emerging careers, um, you could call it in the kind of energy fields. Um, we focus a lot on computer and technology skills, communication skills, especially through the story, and then um, some skills in environmental um, areas. And, uh, and then these things kind of map in some predictive possible way. So um, we incorporate as a company, we're a benefit corporation. Uh, we incorporate a lot, it could be an alternative to the regular textbooks. Um, we have 200 schools in, in the area who have used our materials over the last five years. So um, the, we have done, we've used um, the research, um, which has looked at student motivation and engagement, and that's what's led us to our middle school curriculum. And so we've done some operational pilots, and then we're doing grade seven and eight field testing right now um, in a variety of schools. So if you have any colleagues in middle school who might be looking for some NGSS science curriculum, um, please point them our way. So I want to thank you for listening to my journey, and I look forward to um, to the panel where we can have a bit of chat. Thank you very much.